So Brent Blake is going to open us in prayer. Brent, you want to? Yeah, yes. my pleasure. You bet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this uh, opportunity to peel away from our busy schedules for an hour and listen to Gordon's discussion there. We're just grateful that he's here to share his, his uh, story and his and his, his, his activities with us. And uh, we ask that you uh, you be with us in ways that uh, help us recognize how we can serve you better and make this world a better place. And we just uh, are so much looking forward to the uh, to the day when we get all this COVID activity behind us, get it under control, where we can meet face to face again up at the college again, like the uh, the fun times of the past. But we do thank this group for pulling pulling this uh, monthly meeting together. We're glad glad Paul and his team are continuing to, to drive this activity even in the current condition, and uh, we're just here to. To hear your word, God, and to, uh, to to join in fellowship and make new relationships here amongst our group, and uh, I'm just grateful that we have this opportunity to listen in and grow in our faith. And we thank you for that. In your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate sure. that. Okay, so um, the board is going to is going to talk here uh, in the next couple of weeks to uh, decide on August, whether we meet in person or do a Zoom meeting. So we will let you know as soon as we know. Um, and, and so, you know, we continue to have operating expenses. So if anybody would like to make a donation, uh, we, we would appreciate that. And is, is uh, Mackenzie on the line? Oh, okay. I was gonna have Mackenzie explain something. We now have the ability to um, receive donations uh, either by PayPal or with a QR code. And since I don't know how to explain a QR code, I need uh, Mackenzie to do that unless somebody else can do that. Uh -oh. It's really it's really easy. All you have to do is put your phone, if you have an iPhone, just hold your phone over it. You can take it, you can go to your picture mode, hold your phone over it and it will pop up and it will cue you exactly how to fill that information in. So it'll take you directly to the website and you just fill um, in your information um, through there, so it's really easy. If you don't have an, if you don't have an, if you don't have an iPhone, you can download a QR app that will read it the same. But um, most smartphones just act like you're taking a picture, and it'll read it right away. And it'll be a little drop down at the top. You'll have to click, and then it'll pull up the site. Thanks, Marta. Easy as pie. Yeah. Um. So, so we, of course, we meet the second Tuesday of every month, usually at Lone Star College, but they're closed for the summer. So we won't be doing that. If we do meet face-to-face, -face, it'll be at Church 137 here in Tomball. They've been gracious enough to let us use their church anytime we can't meet at the college. So that's, uh, that's really a great blessing <clears throat> for us. Uh, we still have sponsorships available for uh, any given luncheon. Uh, sponsorships are $150, and anybody or any company that would like to do that, we would sure appreciate that. So Hank and Kingdom God were supposed to be our speaker today, and Hank has assured me that he will reschedule with us for next year. So we'll get he and the dogs in next year. Uh, and then Ken Klingerman is gonna be our speaker next month from Harris County Precinct 4. Thank you, Kent. And um, Leo Corley, our, our, uh, our Tomball guy, uh, will be speaking to us in September. And he's, he's already told me that if we if we're going to do it on a Zoom meeting, it won't. His presentation won't lend itself to that, so he, he will do it if we have a face-to-face uh, -face meeting. So, also want to let everybody know that we're recording this session, and so uh, when we go to the Q and A, if you have anything to say, make sure that you're uh, comfortable that uh, people can hear it because we'll post it to our website after the meeting. Thank, thanks to Janetta, we'll get it posted on our on our website. So, thank you for that. Okay, now I want to introduce you to my good friend, Gordon McCaughey. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a real blessing that, uh, that we get to hear Gordon today because if we were doing it face-to-face, -face, we wouldn't have that opportunity. So that's kind of a silver lining in, in all of this uh, COVID stuff. So, so Gordon has a long career of operational leadership experience with emphasis on environmental management strategies. He's managed to work at the corporate upstream and downstream aspects of the oil and petrochemical industry. And he is excellent, uh, excellent at all of that because I've worked with him as a consultant. Uh, uh, I and my team worked with him for several years and uh, he is, he's really a great leader in that area. 
Uh, you have a lot more information on Gord's professional career in your flyers and in the uh, on the website. And I, I got to tell you, I got to. I had a chuckle because one of the uh, folks that RSVP'd asked me if he was going to uh, just speak about his career, all the things he had in, in the flyer, or if he was going to talk about Jesus. And, uh, and I kind of chuckled at that because uh, he's a fearless disciple and he never misses a, a chance to share his faith. So he will talk about Jesus for sure. I, I know that. Um, he earned an executive MBA degree in operations management at the Haskins School, University of Calgary, and he also attended the Deming School of Management at the University of Washington. He and his wonderful wife, Jill, have five grown children and four grandchildren. They live in Cochrane, Alberta, Canada, half the year, and Queen Creek, Arizona, the other half. It's not a bad life. He gets to be, uh, be away from the heat and the cold uh, all the time. And I will mention also, he's a uh, a great golfer and he beats me like a drum whenever we uh, play together. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, introducing him to you here and having you uh, hear Gord's message. And so Gord, I'm gonna turn it over to you right now. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon everyone. I, I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be here and to uh, have this little talk with you. And I thought I'd start off uh, my session with um, my title, the title I've uh, picked up is Living Life Alive. It's a book my, my mother wrote on um, being, uh, it's in rehabilitation and progressing through life. And um, just let me read a couple things as introduction. I'll reach out to others as his love compels me. I will then be able to work for the rest restoration of others with similar problems and thereby become stronger myself. Our recovery comes through God's work, not through good work. Psalm 51 is a prayer of David in a verse three. We see him acknowledging his wrongdoings. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. In verse one, he, he asks for mercy. And in verse 10, he is asking for a clean heart. David was confessing the shameful deeds of his adultery and murder, which you can read about in 2 Samuel 11. He makes no excuses. Let's be willing to struggle with ourselves and settle for nothing less than total honesty when we walk with the Lord. This kind of praying is not always comfortable, but always very profitable. Until man has gotten into trouble with his heart, he is not likely to get out of trouble with God. These are words that have guided my life as I've, as I've had my Christian walk. And, and as a, when I was a boy, my mother and father decided to become Salvation Army ministers. They did this at the age of 33. They had three children. Uh, we had had a fourth, another brother that had died of crib death uh, uh, very early or much earlier on. But at 33, they decided to commit their lives to God because their, their lives had gotten to a point where they felt they were not in control anymore. Um, they, uh, I, I asked my father many times about this and why he, uh, why he did this. But um, I, I think uh, he, he if, he was a little evasive with me as he got older, but he did, uh, he did say it was much more than worth it. And uh, when we did this, we sold everything we had. My father had to go to his employer and say, um, he was an insurance salesman, and uh, went to his employer and said, listen, I've, I've, my wife and I have got the call of God. We are going to go and become Salvation Army ministers. Uh, the employer said, well, when are you doing this? He said, in September next year, uh, that's when I'll be going. My father hadn't quit smoking yet, <laughs> and in the army, that's a big deal. But he, he was a two-pack-a-day man, and uh, but was doing this out on faith and saying, "Yes, I'm going to do this." His father had done it before him, and when you do this in the Salvation Army, you don't do it as an individual; you do it as a couple or as a family. So uh, my mother was also trained as a Salvation Army minister, became an author, did all kinds of things, but. Um, my father's employer fired him on the spot. So God's walk, right? It's not an easy one. It's not one you do just but step by step. It's something you have to live. So he went and got a, a job as a truck driver for the next year. Um, it was three months before he became a salvation army when he went into training. Uh, he finally laid his cigarettes down on the side of the road. He told me this. 
he prayed, he kneeled down beside the truck and prayed and gave up smoking. And uh, that was the beginning of a long walk for us because we, at, as children, I remember having to stop playing baseball on Sundays and having to all of a sudden, we're going to church. And then I had to go become a bandsman, a junior bandsman. So I had to learn to play a cornet. And, uh, and every Tuesday I went for lessons to become a, a musician. And then uh, within the first week and a half, though, I was given a cornet. And I was walking to school one day and I had my, and, and, and I was off to school and, and it was first day of school. And they said, they're gonna have a, a, um, a big uh, group, group of, uh, welcoming to all the students. And they wondered if anybody played musical instruments. Well, my hand went right up. Yes, I play a cornet. I've played it for a week and a half now, you know. <laughs> and so uh, they said, good, we want you to play O Canada. Uh, this may be telling of what kind of person I am and uh, what happens along my life. But uh, I said, okay, yeah. And that, the, next week I would be playing O Canada in the assembly. Uh, my uncle, my mother called my uncle right away because he was a musician and he came over and for every day for the next week, I learned how to play O Canada and did play O Canada when I went in. So as we, as we went into this, my, my, my parents uh, went to Bible school in Toronto, with no income for two years, uh, lived in a, uh, had to sell everything they had. They were allowed to buy a small car because we had a family of three kids. So they bought a Morris Minor. My father had owned a brand new uh, Dodge with the 57 wings on the back and all that stuff and, and had uh, all those uh, uh, in life, uh, very, uh, very well kept man, I guess. But uh, anyway, we had this little Morris Minor and, and that's what we had around our, our training college days. The first week I entered it, I got into a, uh, a, uh, a ring ring a hockey game and uh, had one of my teeth knocked out and uh, and I blackened the guy's eyes that did it to me and that all came back up into my parents world of being so being accredited selfish army people and I was gonna be a problem I think but anyway we we did survive Bible school and we moved uh, every year and a half for the rest of my my term with them and um, we, uh, I went to, I, w I was a bandsman, I wore full uniform. I had become a, I became a junior soldier. I gave my heart to the Lord at the age of nine. I remember my friend going forward in Sunday school and, uh, and they were singing songs and, and we had what they called the penitent forms. I don't know, I know many churches have this, our mercy seat, uh, where you go forward and you give your life to Christ. Well, my friend had gone up and I was crying anyway, so I went up and I gave my life to Christ. And I remember signing my junior soldier pledge a year later after I'd been through um, a year of Bible study. I, I signed a Bible, a, a pledge that I would become a junior soldier for Christ, that I would enter the war of faith. I did this, and, and I, I still remember, and I signed my name. When I signed my name, I had it hanging in my room for a year, forever, but we moved so many times, I lost it along the way. But I signed my name, and it went along, and then up the side, and because it was Gordon, Leroy, and McCauley, and I had to go all the way across there. So I gave my life to Christ at that point. We were, uh, we were good uh, Salvation Army folks along the way. My parents were in small towns. We moved, as I said, every year and a half. I lived in Toronto three times, Stratford, Bridgetown, Ontario, London, Ontario, Ottawa, Ontario. Um, then we moved out to the West, West Coast into Victoria. And my father was in rehabilitation uh, and my mother were in rehabilitation. But they would pick us up some, uh, sometimes on, and uh, we'd go out into some small towns, ringing bells at Christmas. You've all seen that out there. But my brother and sister and I would be dropped off and in small, small towns and we'd take our turn ringing bells. And uh, later on, it was as my bandsman uh, material increased and I was better at it. I was uh, able to join the band and go to prisons, go to uh, old folks homes. We did uh, services. We had every Thursday night practice. Every Sunday was two services I went to. 
And then, uh, and we went to the church. My father and mother went to the rehabilitation center. And that was where the men were and where the soup lines were. And they would have a Thursday night service. And we would go to those as well and, uh, and uh, bring men to the Lord. And that's my, what was my father's, uh, father's direction in life. My direction in life started going, uh, so we, we got dropped off I, in Calgary. Um, my father had, the, had an appointment here. He was in charge of men's social. We'd been here for a year and a half. I turned 18 and my father called me to his office. Now I was uh, a long haired little young guy with, uh, I'll show you a picture here. Well, that's, uh, oh, let me get it right here. There we go. This is a gospel group I, w I entered into, and uh, I'm the guy right over here, right here, yeah, in there. And uh, I entered into this this group to, uh, and it saved saved my life in in my Christian walk as I was going along. But at 18, my dad called me to his office. I went to, into his office, and he he told me he said. Uh, Listen, Gord, uh, you know, every year and a half we've been moving and it might happen this year. And you've got to know at 18, they don't pay for your move anymore. So you better become self-sufficient self -sufficient here. I said, okay, Dad. So I got myself a great job at the railway that summer and, uh, and took off, got my own apartment. And sure enough, he stayed for three years. <laughs> but... I was I was all set and on my own and getting getting out into life, getting out into life. Though as a young man, uh, there were lots of temptations and lots of things that went kind of sideways. The band, this uh, this uh, Hallelujah sound that I was a part of, this group. Uh, there was a 40, 45 year old man started this group, and my dad went to that man, and I had already been in the group a few years, and my dad went to that man and said, "Listen." We could be moving at the same time he had this other conversation with me. He said, we could be moving, and I want you to be uh, a parent to my son, if you would. Uh, just, you know, help, follow him along and help him out if you can. You're already doing that. If you'll just, you know, please be with him because I may not be. And sure enough, they got moved to Germany for three and a half years and served in the military there, serving the U.S. and Canadian military as pastors for three and a half years in uh, Baden-Baden, Germany. Uh, a few years later, I decided to get married and uh, did to a young girl. And I had had some upheavals and, and uh, gotten into a few drugs. And in my first job, they were, the night shift was awful and, and they were into all kinds of things. I, I saw fit to try and get myself out of there and get into something else. At least I was a little, not as so, so much into it. But then things went a little bit wrong and I... Uh, I ended up uh, quitting that job and saying, okay, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I went to my dad, who was still there at the time, and just, just said, dad, I've had this problem, and I'm, I'm confessing that, uh, that I've got an addiction or, or at least a problem that I need to get control of, and I did. And um, I worked with my father for two years. It was the most blessed years I think I've ever had in my life because I got to be – I went into the police sciences program, uh, did a, a course, full course in counseling for a year um, and uh, was a counselor with my dad with alcoholism and, and addictions for two years. Also did a year um, uh, on uh, uh, pre, uh, suicide calls of uh, helping people in suicide and how that, how that came about was uh, through our program and they needed somebody from the hospitals. They want, the hospitals and the police force wanted somebody with a Christian background to go and do the first touches with these people and see if they needed medical or emotional or physical or, uh, or, uh, or even just protection. And so I would do that. I thought that my life was going along fairly well. I got married. Uh, I thought I told my wife I wanted to become a Salvation Army minister. That's what I wanted to be what my father was, which was the greatest guy I'd ever met, right? And uh, she, uh, she didn't tell me she didn't like that idea. Her parents told her they thought I was a, you know, long-haired, weird, stupid, drug, whatever. Poor kid that's going nowhere for the rest of his life. 
and uh, we had our troubles. We had eight years of counseling, and then that didn't that didn't work out. But what did work out was those men that my dad had put in, in looking at me, because Bob Simper, the man that was in that photo, the, the leader of the band, also was talking to a couple other guys in our church, and we were doing uh, men's food uh, or cooking, and we would do banquets. We built. Uh, I think five or six schools in South Africa and, and a couple of hospitals all through doing that program. And uh, but those men became uh, way influential in my life because as my marriage started to fall apart, I started realizing that, you know, if I'm, if I'm divorced or in trouble or my wife isn't going to go, then I can't become a Salvation Army minister. The counseling I was getting was with the uh, Christian uh, Men's and uh, Pastoral Institute here in Calgary. I ended up going on the board of the Institute as well, helping them out with golf tournaments and all other kinds of things that I know I can do. But my wife and I were going to counseling there. But my, my counselor finally said, no, this, you know, Gord, you're going to have to make a decision. She's not going to change. This isn't going to change. Her parents are psychologically abusing her and there's nothing we can do about it. So I went with my friend and we prayed all night, one night. After, after I learned that I was gonna to have to do this, I, I decided to get a divorce and it was a hard decision for me because it was against everything I believed. I did this and then I prayed with my friend all night. We prayed, and and I can't I, I can remember clearly the struggle of uh, Jacob and and God on the ladder, right? And and uh, I remember the the I'm gonna the, I wrote a song at the time actually it was called I'm gonna hold on until you bless me. I'm gonna hold on until you bless me, and I did, and I decided okay at that point. I'm just going to do what I need to do. I'm going to go out and get a job, and uh, and or go out and get a get a life going here. I had a good job. I was IBM's uh, uh, spearhead guy in this whole region for delivering and and men, and putting their equipment in place, and I was doing that. But as I had gone through that, my my counseling with my with my wife, one of the things that came up when we had separated for a year at one point. And uh, I had dated somebody else, and it was at work. And uh, my pastor called me up to meet with him because the other pastor had called him. And so my wife and I went, and, and he said, uh, listen, Gordon, if you're really serious about trying to save this marriage, one of the things you're going to have to do is um, quit that job because you dated a girl inside that place, right? Now, no telling what you did or what anything. It's not serious and everything else, but you're going to have to do this. So he said, I said, well, this is pretty easy for you to say. This is a $32 an hour job, right? And at that time, that was big money, big money. He said, nope, that's, I'm going to ask you to do that. And I need you to do that. So I quit my job. I didn't go on pokey, but I prayed a lot. I prayed a lot. I listened to a lot of gospel music. And I was in my apartment where we lived and listening to gospel music like crazy and phone call came across. I answered the phone. I recognized the voice right right away. It was the uh he was the chairman of the board on the at the at the uh church. He he, he led the the the, uh, the the board at the church. And uh he had led a number of places that I had been in and we had I sang in in uh huge plays with 2,500 people in the audience and all the rest of this. And we had done these plays and I was one of the feature, feature people. And I knew he thought a lot of me. And here I was at home broken, listening to music and getting a call from him. And I thought, this can't be anything good. And I hung up. <laughs> he always, always said, hello. I didn't say anything. I, hung up. I was scared to death. So he called back. Thank God. Thank God he called back. Uh, and he said, listen, there's a job. I, at this point, I refused to take pogey. I was working for a, a friend of ours that was in the food business, was on our team doing these dinners and that, and he was, uh, he was running an RCAF wing, 
which is a military kind of um, for military men, but had banquets and weddings and, and all kinds of things like this in this facility. So I was cleaning that place and doing that and looking for a job, another job, the real job. Well, this guy calls me uh, uh, Chuck Stevens, senior guy in our church. Chuck is gone now, God bless him. And uh, he said, listen, I, there's a job here that you can apply for. I'm not telling anybody you applied for it. I'm not telling them I know you. I'm not telling them anything. You go down and apply. Get a suit. Go down there and apply. And if you make it, then I will be the final authority on whether you get a job or not. I said, well, wow, that's something. So I, I, I got a suit from my mother. <laughs> well, the, now, I lived my whole life at what they call IC, ICI. It came in. <laughs> you know, your shoes, it came in. Your pants, it came in. Because my father and mother earned $145 a week. That was it. Had three children. A fourth came right after they were, they came out of training college. And uh, anyway, my mom said, don't worry. A suit just came in. <laughs> you're, you're covered, right? So I put on this suit. It was gray with red and yellow stripes in it. It was, it was a piece of work. <laughs> so I went to the interview. It was a Pan-Canadian Petroleum. And uh, I joined Pan-Canadian Petroleum, and uh, they uh, brought me on as a, a purchasing, a junior purchasing guy clerk. Uh, worked for a 25-year-old guy. I think I was about 28 at the time. And uh, 26, 28, yeah, 28 at the time. And uh, so I worked with this young guy. and uh, And... I ended up with a great mentor who uh, who advanced me in my career and did great things with me. But it was that one man, it was those men at the church who reached out and opened up my, the door in my life and opened up another opportunity. I remember the human resources person said to me uh, when I was doing my sign on, she said, listen, uh, you know, I don't know how you got in here. You've got a grade 11, and uh, that's all you got. At that point, that's what I had, because uh, my dad had scared the heck out of me by telling me I had to, you know, get out and get going, <laughs> get life going. I wanted to impress the old boy. He was, he was a hard man sometimes. But anyway, so I, I got, but this lady says to me, she says, I don't know how you got in here, but you shouldn't ever expect to get any further than a clerk three in this company with your education. I said, I tell you what, you let me in and I'll do the rest with God. That's it. And so I got in and uh, worked my way up and I was a leader of that for a while, then became a, uh, a coach, a Deming coach, and uh, did that for three years. And uh, when I was at the top of my game in purchasing, um, Jill and I had just been married a year and uh, I met Jill and we have the four kids. Uh, five kids all together, and um, there was a, I, I, it was an amazing opportunity to be a coach. It was one of the, the second best uh, titles I ever had in my life. The first one was uh, alcoholism counselor, and then the second one was coach. Because I was a coach to 300 operational people out in the field area, and I was there to help uh, bring the delivery of the product uh, at at higher volumes, lower cost, and decrease uh, the the safety uh, initiatives and what was happening. And uh, I learned that by learning everything from them. So it was that was a, a that was the start of my real career, which I had no no inkling in my early life that that would be my life. From there, I got an education, I got a GED, then I got a master's in operations, and then I got, you know, I, well, when I was coaching, I got a degree in uh, coaching, a business coaching counselor, uh, Deming, Deming methodology of statistical analysis, did all that, and uh, was able to do so much in my, my work life. That, and as Paul says, uh, had many times when we were, uh, I was given opportunities um, one, one of those opportunities was when, when I was uh, moved into Panoka, that once, 
once I had worked out as a counselor or as a coach for three years, three years, no advancement, you could not transfer and you could not, and there was no raises for the three years. And that was so that we would be stable in our places. And they poured a ton of education at us. I uh, had a, a psychologist as a, uh, a regular mentor or was mentoring me and ho ho helping me. I had a full-time coach for myself just to help with the coaching I was doing. And uh, we were able to, I was able to do just amazing work there, but I learned so much about operations that uh, when I, when it was time for me to come out, they decided to make me an operational leader within the, within the area. And now they didn't make me a super, like the manager of the operations, they made me the next guy down. And uh, so I had 300 people reporting to me and I reported to one guy all out in this field operation area. I kind of said, this doesn't make any sense. I worked my whole coaching life, decreased cost, decreased stress, structure, increased ability to make decisions, you know, ex expedite things. So I said this to the guy that was there, the lead guy, Al Farmer and uh, the VP, and they said, well, you're probably right. And we were wondering about that too. I said, well, listen, why, why don't, for the next six months, I'll go help you make all the reorganization changes we need to make if we need to make them. I'll make structural changes if we need to make them. I'll look at the bottom lines and see where we can advance that harder now and look at where we can decrease our costs. And I'll treat people with equity and make sure that we really get them in the places we really need them to work and really get things going. So I did that. And six months later, I said, okay, now here we are. And everybody's happy. We made amazing. We were we had increased production by 15 percent. Our costs had gone down by about three or five, three to five percent. Our safety statistics were down to scratch and and, and bangs, you know, that little, little stuff. And uh, so they said to me, "Well, you know, you've never really led an operation from the front from the front line." I said, "Well, you guys should have told me this before. Maybe maybe that would have been a good idea." They said, "No, you know, we really think you should become now a foreman." With our in our ranks, in other words, lead one of the small the the ten production teams that were out there. I said, okay. I said, well, I've just done everything to reorganize the men, but manpower, and I know all that. I know all I, I know these operational areas. I, all I can tell you is, wherever you put me, I'm going to make everybody look like they're standing still, and I'm going to I'm going to make something really happen. And then whatever you guys want to do next we ought to have a timeline about what that looks like. They said, well, let's give it about a year then. I said, okay. So I went out into the field and I had my first group meeting and the, and the guys were out there and we had a great time. And in these 10 guys that I get to now lead from 300 down to 10 people seemed easy. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was really, really working great. And so I, I had this one old guy on my team. He was about 63, you know, at the time. And he, I said to him, I said, well, what kind of opportunities do you think are out here? He said, I got a whole thing full of things that nobody wanted to listen to ever. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's look at those. Well, it was a shell gas operation and we increased production by, by 20% and we decreased costs and we did all this stuff. And then I, I, I said to my men, listen, uh, and they had said to me, are you going to follow us out to work every day? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that's what the other guy used to do to make sure we got to work and we stayed at work. I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, you know, uh, well, one young guy said to me, he says, listen, I'm going to be off for the next uh, four weeks because uh, uh, four weekends. And he was working at 10 and four schedule, which is every every other weekend you have to work to cover up. And it's low, low. Uh, we have a low equity of people in there. So he said, well, I'm going to. I'm going to be away. I said, well, what's your problem? Do you have a family problem or something going on? He said, no. He said, I golf. Now, now Paul, you can tell this is going to touch my heart. This guy's a golfer instead of operating. I said, well, how are you doing on golf? He says, well, pretty good. I said, well, listen, you got to go talk to the guy, the men because uh, you're going to be letting them down and we're going to have to backfill you being away. And frankly, I don't think we have good enough reason to do that, but you go talk to those guys and come to me tomorrow morning and let me know whether uh, you're going to be, uh, whether you have a plan to manage this or not. And I said, also talk to your girlfriend about this because tomorrow morning, I'm either going to make you the best golfer in the world or the best operator in the world. He kind of looked at me and he said, 
tell your girlfriend that she'll understand. <laughs> he said, okay. So this young guy goes home and he comes back the next morning. He said, uh, Gordy he says, well, I guess I'm going to be the best operator because it pays a heck of a lot better than my golf. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a good decision. And I said, listen, do you mind if I pray with you for a minute? He said, pray with me. He said, well, I said, this is a big decision. You and I are going to enter into something that your life is going to change forever now. He said, wow. So we prayed with him. And then I said, okay, here's the structural plan of what, what it means to advance from where you are to where I think easily you could be. And beyond that, it's up to you. And he goes, okay. So that was one of my first, not my, my real first, I guess. I had had lots of opportunities in coaching to help people along, that we that we helped torn up people and that. But this was where I was in leadership and really made a difference. When I when I did get the super, I, I got a superintendent's job in Northern Alberta out of uh, we out of all these activities. I was there for a year, year and a half, and then moved on to Pinocchio and uh, ran operations. And I know maybe you don't know Canada very well, but I I had a, a, a thousand mile kind of radius area that was in, I was in charge of. And uh, so all the way up into Port St. John, um, um, British Columbia, and ran operations in Northern Alberta. And it was a, a kind of a medium crude, uh, a light crude and, uh, and uh, gas operations. And, had a wonderful time doing that. But my first day on the job, I went in and met the man that I was supposed to replace and he was there, had been there 25 years. And Bobby was a good steward and good worker, uh, but his time had come and he was gonna be there for a year while I was there. Understanding that what I said goes and that's the way it is. So I go into my new corner office thinking I've landed on the top of the world and Everything is going to be wonderful. And the first thing he says to me coming in the door is, welcome to straddling the bomb. Straddling the bomb, what's that? And I said, and he got out of his chair and, and he put his hand out and said, here, sit down right there. I said, no, you sit back down on that thing, get real cozy on it. And then I'll sit over here and you tell me what it is. And it was a, th a 13 mile pipeline that went from a uh, sour oil operation we stripped out 75% uh, of the water, and it still was 5% water, high caustic gases, and uh, and then uh, about 3,000 barrels of oil a day running through this 10-inch pipeline over um, hilly hilly terrain through a hobby farm area. So residence was within uh, 200 yards of the pipeline, right? So, and he said that pipeline's a bare steel pipeline. This is 33% sour oil with high caustic gas in it. I thought, well, and he said, it hasn't been tested for 10 years. I said, and he said, we already had one previous to this and it failed on a six inch line. So this one's been there 10 years and it's gonna, it's gonna fail. I said, well, Bob, you're the operational leader. What are you doing about that? He kind of goes, those engineers are, I said, whoa, 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 don't start with engineers on me. I said, You're, we're in charge of the operation. What are we doing? So I don't have a plan. I said, well, we're going to have to get a plan right now, pal. And so we, I, he said it was two months before the operation was going to shut down for a turnaround. And I said, well, I said, that's not good enough. We're going to have to have two weeks, no more than two weeks. And I said, I'm cutting pressure on the pipe on the pipe right now. I'm gonna cut it down to two thirds. So I cut it down by a third, a third of production, which is thousand barrels a day of oil gone out the window, right? Not gonna be not gonna be delivered. And I had to inform marketing and everybody else with this is the this is what we're doing. There was a lot of prayer going on in my life right there. And uh, as I went out to the field, I realized the 10 men that were out there operating that of that field had been um, convinced to make things look good for the community. In doing that, they had all raised, uh, I found out as I went into this, and you, you dive into these things and you just seem, you're like you're gonna keep going down for a while. And I did, I went down for a little while and uh, 
I had to, I talked to the facility, the lead facility guy with Bob and with the uh, joint venture that was doing the, the, uh, the, they were doing the production, they were, they were doing the final refining of the product uh, off this 30 mile field access. And uh, so I, um, we, we ended up having to go into that pipe and, and do some, and it, it did, show, we did a uh, electronic pig on it and it showed that there were uh, five 20% uh, aisle uh, areas of pipe left, right, in the pipe. We explored those and found out they were at the yellow jacket. The tape was the only thing holding the pipe. We would have, this was a high uh, cowboy area and there was a big stampede in there at that time. There were over 10,000 people in that area. The, uh, the plume rate off of this would have killed 99% at night, 95% during the day. I said, what do we, so now we are gonna repair these pipeline pieces. But in doing that, I also had to then try and repair what was going on with the men. Those 10 men had uh, been telling this story that everything was okay and everything to the public for the last 10 years. And uh, they also had increased all their, all of their life insurance, every one of them. They'd gone and cartelled it and got a great deal, but they were still paying like $300 a month in extra huge life insurance policy. When they got called out on call outs, those men prayed with their wives before they left. It was, uh, when I found this out, it was, it was heart wrenching. So what I did is I said, okay, well, let's get together guys. And uh, I like the, I like one that we're never gonna operate like this again. I wanna have a session with you and your wives so that they know that this is not the company we are. It's one thing to fix a problem, but it's another thing to fix the human condition to go, that's around it. I ended up praying with all of those families individually. I ended up reaching out into their lives and, and he helping them settle down, not to worry anymore. Because we fixed the problems that were there. But we also then had to get the faith back of the people that we entrusted to stand out there, but we had told them to tell a lie and they knew it was a lie. And now we had to turn it around. That was one of the, the bigger aha moments in my, my career. All 10 of those families uh, thanked me over and over and over again for what we did and what I did to help save their husbands. And we advanced probably two or three of those men into other areas because they were phenomenal employees at that point. So what I, uh, I, I'm realizing my time's running, but now in my life, now, now I got to become a, I, I, as Paul said, I work in, my reward of coming out of operations was to go into corporate. <laughs> what a reward. <laughs> Working in corporate is, uh, the guy, the, I remember the, uh, my vice president saying to me, listen, the, the board, they've already met with the board, the CEO and the chief operating officer. They've seen your statistics. They've seen what you've done in every area you've gone to. At this point, I was working in Hardesty now, and uh, they came to me and said, and I'd only, only been there a year and a half, but we've corrected a ton of problems and done a lot of things right. And, uh, and they said, listen, we want you to come to Calgary and do what you've been doing out there here. I said, well, you guys are in charge there. I'm in charge out here. <laughs> That's a difference. Sorry, guys. But I did go, and I had a magnificent career of 15 years, another 15 or so years of traveling the world, uh, helping with operational enhancement, uh, reduction of costs and safety, and talking and praying with people so many times, so many times. Today though, I'm a retired guy. I lived six months in Cochrane, six months in uh, Queen Creek, and I found a ministry on the golf course. <laughs> Funny. Funny place. I, I, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm, I live this lavish life, right? How do I reach out to people? So I, on my golf cart, I have a, a little heart symbol with two hands. It's actually a tattoo I have as well, I guess, on my arm. But I, I, it's, it's a clada, it's called. And it's uh, having faith in uh, 
friends, love, and loyalty. And reaching out that way in your life. So I put that on the front of my cart. Everybody else had a sports finger on their, you know, some team, whatever they, whatever's going on. Which today doesn't mean much because nobody's playing any sports. <laughs> so anyway, I had I have this on the front of my cart, and uh, I met a number of men along the way. Well, I'm just going to mention two: Kevin Volsang, uh, his wife Cecile had cancer. I met I met Kevin on the uh, on the driving range. I was going to play with him that morning. He's a great golfer, and uh, he told me he said oh, I'm having a tough time. I, I said How are you doing? Instead of saying everything's fine, he said I'm having a tough time. I said Well, what, what's it about? He said Cecile's got cancer. That's not good, Corey. Joe, I can't hold. I prayed with Jill, and Jill, wonderful action person. She makes she makes a quilt for Cecile. And I called Kevin up, and I I told Kevin, I'm, "Listen, I'm going to be praying for you now. Every Wednesday, I'm going to pray for you and your wife." And I shared with him scripture, a few things, and then I called him up, and I said, "Listen." Kevin, my wife has made this wonderful uh, uh, quilt for your wife to warm her during her treatments and, you know, just have it home. He said, I'd like to bring it to you. He couldn't believe it. So I took it to him and I just, I, I, I said, I'll meet you in the parking lot before we play. I'll just meet you in the parking lot. I don't want to make, it's not a big deal. So I gave it to him. He broke down. He said, Gord, who is this God? Just, who is this God? Kevin, Cecilia lost her back. Kevin, one is back. Because he took that on. Then, in this last year, in January 17th, this year, I was, I played with guys, I played golf with this guy. He's a, he's a wild cat, a wild cat. He's out of Seal of Washington, runs his own car, car business, used car lot. Brian Harris used cars. He's an amazing guy, big cigar, fedora hat, colorful clothing, wild man, right? January 17th, he gets a call. Back in Seymour, Washington, he's got a place down and we golf down south there together. He gets a call. The boy that he had taken in to his car business uh, when he was 15 years old, 15 years later, is married to his daughter. He helped boy, bring this boy out of uh, the depths of drug addiction and, and uh, his family was totally drugged up and everything. Brought him into his home, had him live in his home for those 15 years, for 10 of those years. Made sure he had an education. His daughter fell in love with that boy. That boy murdered his daughter on January 17th. Tied her to a chair in their living room and then beat her to death. And now, what we have left is grief. And Fran and, and Brian have one other daughter. That we, when we were there and Brian took off to, to go up, be with his family, the boy committed suicide afterwards. Nothing left to, nowhere to go for a sense of retaliation or hurt. So a friend of mine, and O'Brien's and I, because he knew I was a Christian, and he knew I'd go to Mountain View Church in, in Queen Creek. 
And he said, Gord, you know a pastor or something? Could we do something? Could we set up a commemorative? Now, on the time there, he's going to have a service up there. Can we have a service here for all the people here that want to reach out to him? I said, of course we can. So we had an outdoor service, and Pastor Daniel Voss at the Mountain View Church came and spoke. And, and we, sp- we spoke, and we had a couple other speakers, and we had lots of songs. And about 150 people showed up outside on a Sunday morning, seven o'clock in the morning, and we all prayed. I pray every day with Brian. I am a big believer in using version, the Bible study uh, medium. And every morning I send him one of those. And I always make sure I have one that I am reading about grief. This is something that doesn't go on for a short time. It goes on for a long time. And there's a a picture of Brian filled out of how he feels now without his daughter. This is a, a art piece called Melancholy. Albert Gorski made it, and it's in Lake Geneva, Switzerland. But it it typifies what is left after. I'm going here, here, there. What's left when you're in that kind of grief? Brian, this weekend, is in a dog kennel on his car lot, (laughs) raising money for the YMCA, YWCA, to help prevent violence against women. And he's been in there since yesterday morning at 8 o'clock. He'll be there till 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. If you have a mind to, Put him in your prayers. He's still, he and Fred are still in some, you know, mature grief, really, but still wondering why, you know, how that happened to them. But it did. We got a little song I'm going to sing you, and it's it's typical of. Where we are right now, we're in a world where the battle is with something that's unseen. How familiar are we with that, with Christianity? The battle we have is against that, which is unseen. We don't know, we don't know if we have the skills, but I can tell you, we don't. Because our recovery comes through God's work, not through good work. We have to remember, God is in charge. So it's a little one I learned on a Sunday school bus years and years and years and years ago. It's just a little tune. I just want to sing it to you for a second, and you'll see what it means. So then water will not wash your sins away. You will have to get down on your knees and pray. If you want to climb those stairs, you will have to say your prayers. So then water will not wash your sins away. And that's it for me, folks. God bless you and keep you. And I hope you your lives are enriched just a little bit by this conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. That was great. I, I was going to ask uh, anybody, if any, anybody, any questions or anything they want to say. Unmute your phone if you would, and, uh, and, and jump in if you have any any questions for board. Uh, Gordon, I, I, I'm just going to share something real quick that a, that a few of us know real well. Uh, one of our our good friends at, at the church that uh, a couple of us go to. Uh, I'm going to introduce it to you anyway, but he. He grew up Salvation Army. His mom and dad were Salvation oh, Army yeah. all his life. Uh, and here, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, Brent, his his daughter was engaged, and, and that way uh, killed her, mutilated her, cut her up, burned her in the fireplace, and he had similar ex- experience that to go through as your, as your friend there. So uh, it, it's just a horrible, horrible situation. But I will introduce you to Paul, and you guys can... Uh, can, can talk about Salvation Army and other things. Sure. Yeah. 
the good old days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody have any uh, any questions or anything to ask Gordon? Get everybody with tears in their eyes, Gordon, after what you just went through there. So. I just want to say thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it.